Hello everyone, welcome to my channel, welcome back. My name is Diana, and in today's video I will be showing you how to draw in detail what could be considered to be a complicated structure. This one just happens to be a church. I will break it down step by step in real time so that you will be able to draw it too. I will also show you how to paint it with watercolors. I will talk about what colors to use, including color mixing. If any of this is of interest to you, then keep on watching. Grab a drink, get comfortable, and let's jump right into it. Okay, here is a picture of what I'm going to be drawing today. It is a picture that we took on a recent family trip um, when we visited Germany just this past summer. So I'm including the image there in case you want to take a screenshot, in case you want to follow along with me. This church is pretty famous there in Germany, partially because it was made to look a bit like a Viking ship. It has a lot of uh, Viking ship design to it. It also has a lot of archaic symbol symbols throughout, especially in the interior. So um, it's become pretty popular. It's a pretty popular landmark there in Germany, and it's frequently visited. It's always full of people. So anyway, I thought that this would be a fun one to try because of the design. There's a lot going on in this building, but I'm hoping that I can break it down enough for you to want to attempt it. <laughs> Or to help you see how you can draw it anyway at least so the first thing i drew was the easiest division line that i could see normally you would want to do the horizon line but the horizon line it's at eye level and it's not readily visible in this image because the church is actually sitting behind a hill the grassy area in the front that you see in the picture that's a hill and the church is sitting behind that and a little bit below so that's actually, the grass line is actually the easiest division line that you can see. So that's what I drew first to make it easier. And I'm using that line as my guide instead of what, what would normally be the horizon line to use. So I started out with that line. I started out with the left side of the building connected to that grass line and I'm focusing on basic shapes. I'm focusing on squares, triangles, rectangles, very basic shapes, both big and small. And because I started with the bottom of the church, I'm trying to get those smaller lines down first. I'm trying to get the smaller bits of roof in, the tower on the right, the small tower section to the right is actually cylindrical shaped. So those are the only lines that you do not want to draw straight. You want those lines to have a curve to it, to them. I'm drawing more areas of the roof, the smaller areas of the walls, Moving over to the cylindrical tower there on the right. And I'm also drawing little lines to indicate the curve that goes around the back, just to emphasize more that, that this is a circular shape for the sake of perspective, because you don't want your image to look flat. You want it to have dimension. And the way to do that is to include these very specific lines that let the viewer know what it is that they're looking at, right? So to indicate that this part of the structure is circular, it's round, then I'm gonna want the roof line, especially the bottom line, to have those curves. And the rest of them, the sides of them, you know, they're just triangular. Here I've moved up to the, to the larger roof, the middle roof. That's the biggest roof that we have here in the picture. 
So that's going to be the easiest to draw. It's basically just a big rectangle with triangle sides. I'm adding the small beams here and there, slowly adding in some of those little details. Here I'm being very careful with this particular roof line with those edges. I'm making sure that the angle is right because there is a smaller structure that sits right in the middle of it, right? This window, not a window, the clock tower. And when I get those sides of the bigger roof down, once those are down, then I'm gonna know where to place that clock tower. Here I'm drawing the side of it. And these, these sides, the sides of the roof, you wanna make sure that they all have the same angle. Whatever angle you're drawing, you wanna make sure that they all match on all of the sides of all of the roofs. Again, perspective. Here I'm repeating what I did, the same square shape, the same triangular shape. The top is, is very small, it's hard to see, but I'm adding the beams that make up this sort of little balcony that sits at the very top there. And also the very last part of the roof, that tiny bit at the top with the metal work sitting right at the top. Now I'm adding smaller parallel lines to the lines that I already drew. Since I already drew the big shapes, then these smaller details are easier to add at this point. There's a lot of woodwork on this church. So I'm just adding straight lines, straight lines to indicate that wooden siding. Um, and that wood is actually spruce wood. It's very beautiful. It's got this reddish tone to it. Here I'm adding uh, a metal detail. The, the tops of all of the roof pieces here, so basically the tops of all the triangles, they have uh, this sort of metal edge to them. So I'm adding that in. There's also some intricate filigree wood on the sides there. And I'm not adding those things in detail. I'm just drawing little dots to indicate that they're intricate. And then I'm adding a thick line of shadow right under those dots. Here I'm adding more of those smaller beams, just small thin lines, very thin lines. I'm adding what is actually some of these archaic symbols, but they're very hard to see. So I'm basically just adding little doodles. They're just little doodles that from far away end up looking like archaic symbols. <laughs> I'm adding more of those thin beams. There's a lot of these little thin beams throughout the structure. Here's some more of those little symbols that I'm doodling in. You don't have to be really intricate about it or detailed. You're just implying. More details, more little details. Here I'm adding the clock. And the clock is just another basic shape, a circle with a square around it. Then I'm adding the hour hand and the minute hand, and that's it. For this wooden siding, I'm just adding straight lines, just a lot of little straight lines. And that goes by quick, you know, it doesn't, it doesn't take too long to add these little lines. More of those lines, more of the dots to indicate the intricate wood, the intricate wood beams on the sides. Little thick dots, I should say. There I'm adding more shadow. These thick lines I'm adding where you can see the deeper shadows of the roof. In the picture, since the sky is overcast, it can be a little bit difficult to see these shadows. But um, at the bottom of the roof, the bottom edge of the roofs and the bottom edge of the 
metal detail at the top. The shadows are always going to be at the bottom of that. So it's easy to, to know to add a thick line there since we're working straight with ink, right? I'm getting those shadows in, building up the image slowly, giving it detail so that it looks dimensional and not flat. I'm adding little windows and these little ones, they're, they're so little that I'm just filling them in with the ink. There's some circular windows there, again, to kind of emulate a Viking ship. And those I'm not filling in. The picture shows that there's glass there. I'm adding smaller details at the bottom. I'm adding those bottom shadows to the roof of the cylindrical little tower there to the right. And then I'm adding lighter shadows to the roof. You want to use very fine strokes for the light shadows. I'm using the tip of the fountain pen. It's actually a fude, a fude tip. It's a Japanese word. It's pronounced fude. And I'm using the very tip of that with the nib upside down to get these super, super fine lines. And then to get the thick lines, I'm turning the nib over the right way and using the, the thicker part. It's got a, the tip of the nib has a 40 degree angle. There's another one that has a 55 degree angle, but I'm not using that one, mine. Both of the ones that I have there both have a 40 degree angle. There you can see, I'm using the thick part of the nib for those thick lines. I'm adding in those really dark windows on the cylindrical tower. Those are very dark, so I'm just filling them in. I'm using very, very fine lines for the wooden siding. And again, I'm adding those deep shadows to the bottom edge of every roof piece. Pretty much every one. I'm adding more shadows to the bottom of the building. Here, this wooden side is very visible, so I'm being more careful with my lines. I'm adding long, thin lines to indicate the woodwork, but also a few deeper lines, slightly deeper lines to indicate the shadows on them. Down here in the balcony area, I'm adding more of the windows. There's a lot of little windows down there. And it's a, it's a balcony, like a, it's like a terrace, a porch. <laughs> so I'm adding deeper shadows there to indicate that. I'm adding very light strokes for the shading on the roof, on all of the roof pieces, very light shading, very light strokes. I'm not pressing down hard. For the shadows underneath the bottom edge of the roofs, I'm also not pressing down hard. I don't have to because I'm using the thick part of the nib. You get more ink out and then you don't have to press hard. I'm building up the shadows slowly to bring the building to life, to make it dimensional. I'm adding that last tower on the left. I left it for last because I needed the whole building as a measuring guide so that I knew exactly where to put that structure. It's very triangular. Even the bottom is not straight. It's also a triangular shape. With very fine strokes, I'm adding the shadows to the roof, the same thing that I did with the rest of the structure. Don't press down hard. Start out light and build it up. Okay, now I'm adding very, very light strokes to indicate the tree that's on the right side there. And there's actually like a rose bush sitting in front of it, but I'm just making it all one tree because I want it to just be loose. I'm not going to be detailed about it when I paint it. I'm adding the evergreen that's on the left side. Just very loose strokes. You can see that I'm holding the pen very far back. And the reason I was using two pens is because I'm using a lot of ink. So the white one actually ran out of ink. 
And here's a close up so that you can see all the details of what I did. And I just realized that that bottom area is not a terrace. It's just, it's a wall, but it does have the most shadow to it. Now I'm wetting the paper for the sky. Normally the sky, because it's such a watered down, it's gonna be such a watered down color. That's usually what I start with, with a painting like this. I start with the sky, that's gonna be my lightest area. I'm wetting the paper. You don't wanna have pools of water on your paper. You wanna have a, you wanna make sure that it has a nice glossy finish, an even glossy finish. And I'm outlining the side of the building there carefully. I don't wanna get water on my building. Once that area is nice and wet, it has an even gloss, then I start adding the color. And you can see there that I divided it. The way that I drew the building, because it's so high up, it affords me the opportunity to divide it so that it'll be easier to work with. So for the sky, I'm adding a mix of um, ultramarine. You can use French ultramarine as well, mixed in with um, cerulean blue or a cobalt blue. I'm also adding a little bit of violet or purple to the mixture for some of the shadows to indicate clouds. While the paper is still wet, I'm also adding a very light toned green because I want all those colors, I want it to be loose, so I want all those colors to blend in together. The paper is still very wet. I'm leaving some gaps for highlights. Now I'm adding a type of hooker's green. You can use hooker's green or just regular green. And I'm building up the color. It's still hooker's green, but I'm adding less and less water to it to deepen the color. And I'm building up the color. And you can see that I'm working pretty fast because I wanna do all this while the paper's still wet. I'm deepening the color further with a little bit of indigo. I'm putting it strategically in areas to give this tree dimension. There I'm adding more indigo to deepen the color further. I'm lifting up some of that color because it ended up blending in too much and I ended up losing some of those highlights. So I'm lifting the color up while the paper is still wet. Now I'm working on the right side. Again, the same thing that I did on the left side. I'm wetting that whole area, being careful to outline the edges of the building there. I'm giving it a glossy finish. I'm making sure that I'm not pooling the water. You want it to be even. Again, I'm putting in that mixture of ultramarine with cerulean blue or cobalt blue. My particular palette has no names, so I'm just using the colors that I know that they look like to me. I'm leaving gaps to indicate clouds. I'm making sure that there's no pools of water. I'm mixing some violet again to my mixture. To give those clouds some shadow. The sky in the picture is very overcast, so I, won't, I just want to make sure that I have enough clouds to help indicate that a bit. My paper is still wet, so while my paper is still wet, I'm adding again that light mixture. That light mixture, by the way, is um, sap green with lemon yellow, for instance. You could also do it with hooker's green, just add more yellow. and I'm letting that blend in right into the sky. You can see that I'm working fairly quickly. I don't want that paper to dry during this part, during this process. I'm leaving gaps for highlights. I'm adding some pink. You can use permanent rose, quinacridone rose, 
You could even use like an alizarin crimson if you have that, or carmine. You can use a rose matter or matter lake. Any one of those will work for the pink. Now I'm using the hooker's green again. And I'm spreading it out. I don't want to bury my pink. And I'm taking creative liberties with this. In the picture, I think it's actually like a rose bush in front of the tree, but I just made it one thing to keep it loose. Again, I'm adding indigo to darken that green. And I'm adding most of that to the bottom. I'm using it to hide a little bit the ink drip <laughs> that happened earlier from my pen because it ran out of ink, but then when I moved my hand away, of course, that little last strip that was in there fell out. <laughs> but it doesn't matter, those things happen. Now I'm, I'm mixing a sort of quinacridone gold by mixing yellow ochre with lemon yellow for the clock. Now I'm starting on the woodwork. For the woodwork, I'm starting out with a very light wash, a very, very watered down wash of, you can use something like English red or a light red, even Indian red or red ochre. Any one of those will work. While it's still wet, I'm adding a deeper shade of it a deeper value for the shadow. I'm adding an even less watered down version of that to the bottom of the roof line there, right underneath the roof. I'm doing the same thing to the wall right there at the bottom where the little windows are. And I'm darkening the area where the windows are because that's where the shadow, the shade is the strongest. I'm building up shadows. And for the shadows, I'm actually mixing uh, a sepia. So for the sepia color, I'm mixing mm, like a burnt umber with indigo. I use the fountain pen again to deepen the shadows a little bit at the bottom. Now I'm adding a very light blue mix to the metal work that's on top of the roofs. I'm also adding that same blue mixture to the windows in the front there, the circular windows. I'm going back to my watered down version of English red, red ochre. Very light. While that's still wet, I'm adding a darker shade of that color. So basically I'm adding a, a burnt umber to it to darken it up. I'm adding a deeper shadow underneath that bottom beam. And I'm doing the same thing to all the woodwork. The same thing, adding that watered down light color first and adding shadows to it while it's still wet. Building up the shadows. That area where, the, where those Windows are in the cylindrical little tower there. That's the darkest part. So I'm deepening that color. I'm deepening those shadows with my sepia mixture. You can see how the, the curve on the bottom of those roofs stands out more when you add those shadows. I added some orange to my English red mixture in order to create a copper color. 
for this copper pipe that's on the top of that little tower there. Again, I'm adding that light color to that woodwork there where the round windows are. I'm also adding it to that, all of the wooden areas. The same thing. The same thing we've been doing to the wood. <laughs> And I'm deepening the shadows where those shadows would naturally be underneath the roof line. Also underneath the beams. The thin beams. I'm adding shadows to these faux archaic symbols. <laughs> Now I'm mixing my own kind of Payne's gray by taking that sepia color and adding cerulean blue to it and a little violet to it and it creates a, a sort of Payne's gray. And I'm using that for these symbols. Since in the picture they, they look like they're made out of metal so I'm indicating that with a Payne's Gray. Now I'm making that mixture more of a sepia. <laughs> to add color to the woodwork where the clock is. I'm going back to more of this English red, red ochre type color for that area. Adding shadows. I'm deepening that blue color that I added earlier. And here I'm just repeating the same thing that we've been doing with the woodwork. Here I'm mixing more of a warm gray for the roof areas. The warm gray you can get by mixing um, brown, like a burnt umber, with violet, indigo, and you can warm it up by adding green. So the ratio is going to vary depending on what colors you're using, but that's the general mixture, those four colors to get this warm gray. I'm mixing a bit of a sepia to deepen the shadows of that gray. And that warm gray is very watered down. While the paper is wet, I'm actually using the ink from the fountain pen to create the shadow that's right at the top of that roof. I'm letting the ink flow into the wetness and then I'm using this fine brush to spread it out and to create those variations in line, all for the shading. I'm doing the same thing up here, but for the shadow, I'm using just sepia because the shadow is not that strong up there. I'm repeating the process to that middle roof, that smaller one on the clock tower. And all the way up to the top, just the same process. The 
the same warm gray mixture is going on the cylindrical roof here. All three parts. And I'm continuing to use the sepia color mixture for the shadow and the shadows on the right. You can see that clearly in the picture. And you want to make sure to add that deeper tone while the, while the warm gray is still wet so that it blends out nicely. Just the same thing down here. Deepening the color, adding a darker sepia. A less watered down sepia mixture. I'm adding that same darker value here to the roof right there, just to emphasize the curve of that right side tower. I keep calling it a tower. Just continuing with the roof, continuing to define the different areas of the roof to give it dimension. And I'm deepening the shadows to show all of these different areas to put emphasis on these areas so that you can see that it's not just one thing, that they have different shapes, they're all facing different ways. So you want to put your shadows in the direction that these roofs are facing. Now I'm adding the grass with a very watered down light green. Now I'm adding hooker's green, just a straight up pure color, while that's still wet, to different areas. I'm adding a yellow ochre burnt umber mix, or burnt sienna, either one. Spreading it out while it's all still wet. While my paper's still wet, I'm adding some pink. And I'm exaggerating the flowers that are in the picture. There's a few, there's like a handful of pink flowers in the picture. I'm exaggerating it. Again, leaving it very loose. I'm adding hooker's green to it. It's all still wet. Now I'm adding green to the shrubbery on the right. It's actually just a bunch of leaves, but I'm making it a big shrub. Now I'm adding some interest by adding splatters. I'm adding splatters of the green, which to me looks like a hooker's green. That's why I keep calling it that and yellow ochre. I'm adding another shrub to the left. And this is sap green, more of a sap green with a little bit of yellow mixed into it. The paper's dry at this point, so I'm just adding it on top. I'm adding some darker values with hooker's green. And for that yellow, I'm just grabbing yellow lemon directly from the pan. Hardly any water to it because I want it to be visible. I'm doing the same thing on the right side. Just very random marks. Keeping it loose, I'm adding hooker's green. Some areas are still wet, some areas are dry. It doesn't matter at this point. You're just adding color very loosely to indicate these elements. I'm adding another little shrub there next to the pink. And now I'm emphasizing the pink. Putting a deeper shade of it 
I'm adding green, letting the colors mix on the paper. And that's it. Now I'm writing the name, Gustav Adolf Stabkirche. And I'm signing it. And that's it. That's the finished piece. I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks so much for being here and I'll see you in the next one. Bye guys.